right, Matt. So let's uh, let's talk about who you are, what you do, and your whole journey through dieting, exercise, and all of that. I'm just a man, Michael. I'm <laughs> just a man. Um, no, I uh, I got really interested in health and nutrition. Uh, it's just kind of always been with me. I remember even as a kid, I was always picking my breakfast cereals based on what had the highest percentages of the RDA on, on the spines. And even as like an eight or nine year old, it was ridiculous. So, yeah. um, so I was always been uh, nerdy about health and interested in it and, um, always wanting to be proactive. It wasn't until my l I, mid to late twenties that, um, I, you know, I really decided to jump both feet first into health and nutrition research. So I, I really jumped in and started uh, just immerse myself in the field and began writing, blogging, communicating with other people about it. I set out to be, you know, what I quote call quote an independent health researcher, and mm -hmm. that's how I got into it. And you know, over doing it for nearly a decade now, I accumulated just a massive amount of useful information and expertise. I definitely stumbled across some things along the way that. Um, that have been very helpful to thousands of people all over the world. And uh, that's kind of where I'm at today. And I've written a, a, a billion books, too many. I've unpublished almost as many as I have currently for, <laughs> published on <Really? laughs> Amazon. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just, uh, I've been a healthaholic and uh, I'm kind of a recovering healthaholic at this point, which I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll get into a little bit also. But, yeah. but that's, that's me in a nutshell, just a sort of a, a health and nutrition research obsessive, uh, gone author, gone uh, recovering healthaholic. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you've unpublished books. I feel like that's a rare thing, but it, it says a lot about, you know, who you are and what you do. The fact that you're willing to, to change, you know, your ideas and not get attached to anything. That's one thing that's made me unique. I mean, everybody who's followed me knows and has known and recognized instantly from the beginning that I was really looking for answers. I was trying to do my very best to generally just genuinely find the truth. And I was willing to explore all different kinds of ideas and avenues to get there. And, you know, of course, early on, I had ideas, I thought they were correct, I found research that supported it. And then, you know, later on, I found stuff that contradicted it. And then I started thinking differently. And then I realized that my earlier ways of thinking were more primitive and flawed. Mm -hmm. And so I often changed directions and pivoted and pulled a 180, so to speak, which I've been, had many people all the time go, well, you should call it, you should change the name to 360 degree health because you're always, <laughs> you know, f you flip the back the other way now. Yeah. So anyway, I've gotten a lot of grief, but yes, of course, uh, along the way, I'm willing to completely throw out my prior beliefs if I come across a point of view that is superior and more um, evolved in its understanding. And, and that's the process that I've gone through. It's been a process of personal development. And in that process, you know, I've, I've become uh, my information that I disseminate has become more and more valuable because I have grown past those early stages of thinking naively and, and thinking you know, really primitively about what we should eat and drink and nutrition in general. And, uh, you know, I don't know, we'll, we'll discuss all that, I'm sure. And, and people will kind of understand hopefully what I mean by that. But. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, before we get into, I guess, where you at, where you're at now with health, let's talk about your whole journey and the struggles that you've went through and sort of some lessons that you learned from that. Well, I see so many people repeat through the same series of uh, the same sequence that yeah, exactly. I did. So yeah, so hopefully people can actually learn from that and not make those same mistakes, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, that's what I hope everyone gets out of listening to this conversation. Now, yeah. the first thing, like I said, I became just interested in being proactive about my health. I mm -hmm. think it's a good thing. I think there's a lot of people out there that, that take a look around and they know that something is awry. Yeah. There's a lot of unhealthy people. There's a lot of grossly overweight people. It Something about it really seems unhealthy, and we know that there's something about our modern diet yeah. and lifestyle that is not ideal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at first, we kind of buy into the everyday logic that people are just eating too much and, and not getting enough exercise, and that's why they don't feel well and they suffer. And, um, you know, that's kind of how I thought originally. And, uh, you know, people who were fat were just a bunch of lazy bums. And, and so I started off in my teens 
just trying to do more exercise and charting my progress and writing down how many push-ups I did and sit-ups I did and all these kinds of things mm -hmm. into a, a calendar and keeping track of all that. I also started becoming proactive about my food intake. So obviously nobody could ever possibly be you know, lean and ripped enough. And so I was always constantly, perpetually trying to eat as little as I could stand. And that was one of the first big mistakes that I've made. And the consequences of that were basically that I was always eating, trying to eat a perfect Spartan health food diet or trying to not really eat much at all. And then I would get progressively hungrier throughout the day. Yeah. And then I would end up stuffing my face with a bunch of foods that I thought were unhealthy because my cravings had built up throughout the day so strongly. Um, in addition to that, the amount of exercise that I was doing was on a, an upward trajectory as well. So what started out with a few push-ups and sit-ups, you know, my bedroom as a teenager, that later changed to 100-mile bike rides and 500-mile bike tours and really long backpacking trips out in the wilderness and uh -huh. crazy feats of human endurance. Yeah. And, and then combined with that, I was trying to live off of basically rabbit food because in my, in my mind at that time and everything that I'd been bombarded with from the general public's and, and, the, and the media's view about health is that we should eat mostly salad and <laughs> um, whole grains and vegetables and things like that. And no, and, no uh, saturated fat, right? No saturated fat. Yeah. Um, you know, stay away from tasty things and eat mostly this type of low calorie density type of roughage. Mm -hmm. So I tried to eat uh, kind of a, an herbivore's diet while exercising my brains out. And all it really did was make me want to binge harder and harder on Krispy Kreme donuts and ice cream and things <laughs> that I thought were like the worst foods you could possibly eat at the time. And they're probably not ideal foods. Let's not kid ourselves. But at the same time, um, you know, considering what I was doing to myself, which was burning thousands of calories a day, exercising, you know, up to eight to 10 hours a day on average, not every once in a while, but on average, uh, and then trying to eat as little as possible, the most important thing, the priority above all else at that time to keep me functioning, just functioning basically was to get calories. Mm -hmm. So the best foods, the healthiest foods for me at that time are the ones that contain the most calories. Those are the foods that kept me from dropping more and more muscle mass, getting colder and colder, becoming increasingly impotent. And of course, you know, once you get to a point where you're really in a big enough calorie deficit, no matter how old you were. And I was 21 at the time and I was having erectile issues, which is a perfectly well-suited topic for the, the theme of this, yeah. this effective man <laughs> uh, deal. So, so yeah, it was, it was a hard time and I was doing all this stuff in the name of health. Um, so anyway, flash forward to about age 27 and that's when I started to get really serious about eating, you know, the quest for the perfect diet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and The then elusive quest. The elusive quest <laughs> for the perfect diet. And, and I realized, you know, oh, I've been wrong this whole time. And, you know, I should be doing, you know, high-intensity exercise. And I should be eating mostly meat and fat and not all these carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are making me crave all these foods. And, mm -hmm. you know, I probably have candida and all these different things. Yeah, I was yeah. absorbing all this... Uh, all this alternative nutrition and alternative health dogma out there. And I started to follow that kind of stuff. And the initial results were profound. I mean, eating a, a very highly vegetarian roughage based diet while doing a ton of endurance exercise is a libido crusher. It's a muscle mass obliterator. It's a massive cravings facilitator, emotional instability galore. I switched over to this new way of eating and not exercising my brains out. And lo and behold, I started to feel really emotionally stable. Mm -hmm. My mood was good. Muscle mass just grew out of me. I remember the clothes that I was wearing, all my T-shirts started to get really tight, especially in the <laughs> arms, chest, and shoulders. And the pants I had were starting to fall off, and my weight wasn't changing. So my body was undergoing this great metamorphosis yeah. And and I thought that I had unlocked 
the great secret of all things health. And of course, I began preaching the gospel of all that on the internet, like mm-hmm. any uh, young, naive, foolish person would do. Um, and, uh, and, and there I was, you know, preaching the gospel of high, high, uh, high fat, high protein, low carbohydrate eating. And, um, and I would say the first six months of that was the best six months I've ever had in my life. And then all of a sudden things started to progressively go downhill. And I was just absolutely enamored and infatuated with how great I had felt in the first six months Mm -hmm. that I was stubborn about switching and doing something different. Not only had I invested my, you know, everything in, in basically preaching the gospel of this on the internet and writing books and building up a business about this, um, you know, but I was just so enamored with this amazing way that I had felt for six months. I kept just wanting to get back there and I kept restricting more and more. I got to the point where I was, um, eating no carbohydrates at all. That was a mess. And, uh, and then I started doing, um, you know, other things. I did a 30 day milk fast for a while. I mm-hmm. did lots of, uh, fasting at various periods uh, along the way where I would eat nothing, you know, have nothing but fruit juice for a week and other crazy things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was just seeking that elusive, good, healthy feeling, and it, it just kept slipping farther and farther away, and eventually I had to just kind of say, screw it. And then I went through the the screw it phase, which is all this, you know, health food stuff is a bunch of nonsense, and I should just you know, forget all this and go back to eating what I was eating. It was a teenager when I felt great. And when I did that, I felt amazing. I felt a lot better. All the health problems I had accumulated from being a healthaholic uh, went away. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of went, uh, you know, and became a junk fooditarian for a while. And, you know, and then of course I ran into consequences from doing that. And, you know, now the the final phase is sort of getting back into balance and eating a healthy diet, but not in a fanatical, naive, you know, be- belief that that I'm going to find this perfect diet and become a superhuman kind of way. But just basic self care, and also still being functional socially, being able to eat normal food with friends and family, and not be a weirdo, but at the same time still make sure I'm eating nutritious food exercising every day, moving my body around, keeping it functional and mobile, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's kind of the process that I went through. And I see so many people going through that process step by step. And, and that's <clears throat> kind of, I've become sort of the, the, the guy that you go to. I'm the safe haven for recovering healthaholics and dieters and, and people that suffer really harsh eating disorders and, and all that. Yeah. So could would you say there are if you could, you know, make some some bullet points here, were there any major lessons that you learned that you think would be useful useful for people to know? Well, the big one is that you know, first of all, if you have an idea um and you get really excited about it, you find some confirming evidence that that your theory might be right. You know, it's probably not right. And it's because it's health, nutrition, physical function, the human body, it's not simple and it's not static. It's always in motion. It's always a moving target. Our needs, physical, our physiological needs are changing from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. Um, If you just put, let's say, a little bit of salt, if you eat one bite of something salty, Mm -hmm. your body will start to crave water because your body needs to dilute that salt to keep a steady concentration of water to sodium in every cell of your body and in all your 18 liters or whatever of interstitial fluid, your blood. So the body's always doing that. So the the big lesson to me is that our bodies come hardwired with information and voluntary or involuntary mechanisms throughout our bodies and all of our systems that are designed to keep us healthy alive, well, functioning, not sick. Um, And those things work really well. They work for all organisms. We're the only species intelligent enough to actually be able to fill up a bottle of water and see how many ounces 
or milliliters are in that bottle and how much fluid we're consuming. Yet every creature on earth, wild, domestic, and, and otherwise, are able to keep themselves from dying of starvation, of dehydration. They're able to breathe in and out and get all the oxygen that they need and maintain the right proportions of carbon dioxide and oxygen. All these different levels in, in the blood and, and so on in the body, all of our biochemicals, that system works involuntarily. And what we're doing with all these crazy ideas about health is that we're suppressing those internal mechanisms, those internal involuntary mechanisms that work, and we're suppressing those with ideology. And mm -hmm. we're often stifling, oh, we have a craving for this, but we stifle that craving because that's not healthy because of something we read on the internet. Uh, we're not thirsty, we're peeing frequently, hey, it doesn't matter. We know we're supposed to drink X number of ounces of, of water per day because that's what my doctor said or that's what I read on some health website. We're not doing things based on our internal involuntary mechanisms. We're suppressing all that intelligence and we're trying to micromanage this with ideas that are generated inside of our skulls. And it's a disaster. And I'm not saying that we can just eat and do whatever we want and be perfectly healthy, but it's the outcome of doing that and not even thinking about it is usually better than becoming obsessed with it. And it's certainly a lot easier and more fun and will keep you feeling healthier and happier just to try to follow those involuntary cues to eat when you're hungry, drink when you're thirsty, obey some of your cravings, exercise when you feel like exercising, quit exercising when you feel exhausted, not push yourself through it, have a rest day when you don't feel motivated. You know, if we if we obey all these different cues, we get, you know, aligned with our physiological needs and we function a lot better. And and to me, that's the great gem of wisdom that I've come up with is that there is no perfect pristine diet or system out there that you can just apply to yourself and expect it to work, you already have everything you need that you need hardwired. And it's really just a matter of, of, you know, having good enough habits to make sure that you're providing quality food to yourself and not just eating out of convenience. Um, and making sure that you don't just stare at the computer screen all day, mm -hmm. and that you do obey your phys physiological cues to get up and move around and stretch out and go for a walk and be outside do all the things that we know make us feel better, but we don't often do. So I, I don't know. I'm going off on too big of a tangent, but no, no, that's that, that's that's all great. Um, so I mean, basically, what it comes down to is, you know, really listening to the body, right, and sort of letting the body self re regulate, and not being neurotic, not forcing the body to to follow these these ideas that we create, and you know, all of this, this information that's out there. Absolutely. And and even if you are going to go out and follow some kind of new dietary experiment, you still really can't listen to an outside authority. You have to be paying attention to how your body is responding. You have to understand what proper function is, mm -hmm. and you have to make assessments as to how your basic functions are being affected by whatever dietary or lifestyle experiments that you're you're subjecting yourself to, but it's certainly a matter of self-experimentation and evaluation to see how you respond to certain things. And, and between those two things, between proper self-evaluation and relying on instinct to guide you, a combination of two, those two things are going to outperform any kind of miracle diet or product or system or boot camp or cleanse or any of that kind of stuff that's out there for commercial sale. Yeah. So, so you, you talk about function and what, you know, functional health is, what, what health actually is to tell us a little bit about that. Talk about that. Well, I've come up with sort of a, a, a report card, I call it. I don't mm -hmm. know why I use that. Cause I was a terrible student. And the report <laughs> card was, you know, gave me bouts of anxiety every time I heard it. Um, thinking about, you know, how I could forge my parents' signature and keep yeah. it out of their hands and I, I, using lots of white out, you know, what, that, that's kind of anxiety that I feel over hearing report card, but I, <laughs> I created the report card and the report card is just really looking at basic functionality because if you're functioning properly in all your major physiological, uh, 
realms mm -hmm. and all your systems, your basic systems are working correctly, then odds are everything else is working as well as it's capable of working too. So basic systems, one is you're basically your, your thermoregulatory system. So your, your body temperature needs to be 98.6 degrees or 37 degrees Celsius it, you need to have a normal body temperature. And if your body temperature is below that and below normal, it means your body is, is basically conserving energy. It means that your resting metabolic rate is reduced. And when your energy is being conserved in the body and it's not being consumed at the maximum rate in the cells in your body, you suffer all different kinds of consequences. Um, so energy production, energy fuels the proper functionality of all the different systems in your body. Without energy, nothing works. And something as simple as your body temperature can give you a really good assessment of how well your body is consuming energy. And like I said, if it's low, it means that your body's just not consuming energy at the optimal rate. And you will suffer health consequences in a number of different areas from from being in that state for a prolonged period of time. Secondly, um, digestion. You need to have at least one bowel movement per day without straining. And, um, you know, you shouldn't experience a lot of excessive gas and bloating and, uh, you know, acid reflux and those kinds of things. Um, another thing would be your urine. Your urine should have yellow color to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's this crazy idea out there that we should be peeing clear. And we should be properly hydrated, but most people define proper hydration these days in, in the, the, the spectrum of over hydration. You do not want to be, your urine to be really diluted. You do not want to be peeing clear all the time. There is no wild animal on the face of the earth that pees clear. Everything pees yellow and maintains that type of concentration. Mm -hmm. In fact, if an animal is peeing clear, a veterinarian will assume that there's something very wrong with that animal. And uh, there's something very wrong with you if you're urinating frequently. Um, and that's, you know, obviously you can drink too much water and pee a lot, but there's a lot of people who just urinate incessantly even after just one glass of water. And uh, we might get a chance to, to delve into the significance of that later. But, but there should, you know, you should be urinating um, yellow. It should be once every four hours or so during the day and none at night. And, um, and you should see if you could get that dialed in just perfectly. Again, there's no set amount of fluids to drink. It's going to vary from person to person. It varies from day to day. Depends on what the temperature is like. It depends on whether you exercised or not. It depends on how much salt you ate in your breakfast. Did you have breakfast cereal or did you have bacon and eggs? Well, one is a lot saltier than the other. You're going to need to drink more water with one versus the other. And there's no formula that you can calculate on the internet that's going to give you the answer to that. It changes every day, every hour, and so forth. Uh, another uh, aspect that you want to be looking at, of course, men need to have a, a pretty decent sex drive and the ability to have and maintain an erection. Uh, you mm -hmm. need to be able to sleep through the night without waking up. Uh, your skin should be moist, not dry and flaky. Um, you know, and all these different basic things. I could go on. There's other aspects and other fundamentals of proper functionality, but sleep, digestion, sex, body temperature regulation, um, you, uh, fluid concentration in your body, those are some of the things that are, that are represented by some of those really basic things that I just covered. And if you can get all those things right, odds are you're going to be functioning a lot better in the peripheral areas that are connected to all those different systems. Yeah, and getting down, you know, these this basic functionality within your body, your body, your physiology is going to allow you to perform and do all the things that you want to do in life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um it, it affects your mood. It affects uh, you know, the kind of amount of stress that you can withstand. It affects your attitude tremendously. I mean, there's just no doubt about it your attitude completely changed your your energy and what you can perform mentally and physically improves as these physical systems are working properly and um and also it's you know life is not a sprint and a lot of people are are burning themselves out as well because they're not paying attention to how their bodies are working they're not making their proper assessments 
and they're they're spiraling downhill physically. They're starting to experience anxiety. Their hands and feet are getting cold. Their body temperature is dropping. They're urinating frequently. Their bowels start to slow down. They start experiencing all these things, and you can look at that and see what kind of physical training you're doing, what kind of stress you're at at work, or what you're taking on in life in general. You can look at all those things, and if you are moving in the wrong direction, you know it's time to take a break. Um, you know, there's so many people that are experiencing complete and total burnout. Basic awareness of those basic systems in our body can help prevent a lot of that. It can send off the warning signals that you need to ease up off of it um, very, very well and very clearly if people familiarize themselves with those basic things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've laid out you know, what basic functionality is and these sort of metrics that people can pay attention to, to, uh, to listen to their bodies and, you know, make sure they're, they're healthy. What does that mean in practice? You know, so there's no, there's no, you know, specific formula, but what sort of approach can people take? Is there any sort of strategy that they can take to, to tackle this? Well, I wouldn't say there's an exact strategy. Again, like I mm -hmm. said, there's no formula that you can just apply to yourself that's going to yeah. work out the same way for everybody. Um, the first thing is to make sure that your basic needs are met. And a lot of people are uh, underestimating what their basic needs are. Mm -hmm. You need a certain number of calories a day to function well. Calories are energy. And if you're consuming too few calories, you are not going to function optimally. There's no other way around it. It's mm -hmm. impossible to under-consume energy and function optimally. Can't happen. So, you know, we need to consistently eat the adequate quantity of calories. For most men, that's going to be, especially young men under age 30, you know, you're looking at at least 3,000 calories for most normal-sized men. I would look at um, your body weight, if you were lean enough to have visible abs, for those that don't have visible abs, which is most of us, you can estimate what that, that lean weight might be and multiply that by 20. Mm -hmm. and, and that's pounds, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so if you're 150 pounds, you multiply that by 20, you're going to need 3,000 calories a day. Okay. Um, as a minimum, if you're 200 pounds, that could be 4,000. If you start exercising and doing a lot of physical activity, that can go up astronomically from there. Those are minimums just to function properly. Now, once you hit 30, you start to experience some of those inevitable declines in metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, I've, you know, those can be slowed down. Those can be delayed if you look at it honestly and look at the science objectively Yes, there are things that you can do to accelerate aging or decelerate aging, but for the most part, you know, there's really not a whole lot you can do about that decline other than slow it down a tiny bit or speed it up a tiny bit by doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, so you're going to start experiencing a decline in metabolic rate after the age of 30, and that calorie estimate starts to slowly decrease at about, I would say, 1% per year after age 30. And so your food, your basic energy needs in terms of dietary calories starts to slowly decrease at that time. And you can make adjustment for that if you're over age 30 and listening to that. But that's, that's basics. Um, other basics are you need certain macronutrients. We need protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And mm -hmm. when you start eliminating those classes of foods or you start restricting too heavily uh, you're almost always going to run into ill consequences. And again, pay attention to your body temperature, the warmth of your hands and feet, your libido, your mood, your sleep, your digestion. If you do something that is wrong, if you make a mistake there and you restrict overly hard in one area, you will immediately start to recognize a worsening in those areas. Um, so be cautious certainly about going too low in carbohydrates, going too low in fat or becoming a vegan and going too low in protein. Yes, it's possible to eat protein from plant sources. Um, but it's awfully tough to be a complete vegan and not run into ill consequences. All you, all you need to do is listen to your biofeedback 
and it will tell you whether you're getting away with it or not. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, th- that those are some basic things that you can do in terms of meeting your basic needs. Another is sleep. I think people are have this idea that we can get away with getting less sleep. And it's true, we can run on fewer hours of sleep for a long period of time, but eventually it starts to catch up with you. Also, a lot of people have rare, you know, a lot of people have not experienced what it feels like to get truly optimal amount of sleep and realize the increase in quality of the remaining hours <laughs> that they have in the when they're awake. Yeah. Um, you know, the average night's sleep back in the early 1900s and, and before that, when we didn't have all these computers and gadgets and televisions and artificial lighting and all these things that tend to keep us up a lot later than we would otherwise stay up. Average night sleep was over nine hours a night. And now we're starting to creep down below seven hours per night for an average night's sleep for an adult. And there's a lot of metabolic reasons why the average night's sleep starts to go down over time. We we hear that, oh, elderly people only need five hours a night or six hours a night, and you know, babies need twelve. Well, that's not necessarily the case. It's just that it becomes diffi- more and more difficult to sleep as your physiology starts to decline and your metabolic rate starts to decline. And uh, sleep is, is profound. Getting more sleep, going to bed closer to sunset is a very powerful thing. Um, but it also happens to be, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most difficult things to be very, very disciplined about because I can't do it. I mean, I got all kinds of crazy things that I'm juggling and I'm not just going to go to bed when I have some major internet event going on the following day that where something needs to be tended to, um, you know, my sleep schedule is erratic and I suffer the consequences for it. But if there is, if your health is not optimal and you want to take matters into your own hands and improve your health yourself without trying to rely on medications and going that route, which most people are discovering is, you know, has ill consequences down the line as well. You know, sleep is a great place to start. And so is physical activity. I mean, it's just, obviously everybody's talking about how atrocious our, our, you know, physical habits are. And and it's true. You know, I wanted to believe that, uh, that it, it wasn't necessarily true that we didn't need a bunch of physical activity, but that was at a time when I was getting too much. Mm-hmm. And too much physical activity is extremely detrimental. So I became a little bit anti-exercise because I was revolting against this infatuation I had with exercising, that it was a cure-all if you just exercised enough. Yeah, so what's what's your take on exercise? Now, you know, you were exercising too much, so where are you at now with that? Well, I've experienced exercising too little, you know, after revolting uh, against that. You mm-hmm. know, I, I got to the point where... Um, you know, I'd go on a walk and my feet would get sore because I wasn't used to walking. Um, and that was coming from somebody who works seven seasons as a wilderness ranger for the Forest Service. I could walk two or three miles. My feet would be sore after because they be, they atrophied. Yeah. Their toughness started to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to experience the stiffness and the lack of mobility from sitting so much. Um, I started to experience you know, getting winded really easily. Again, you know, carrying some groceries up a flight of stairs and being winded and tired and worn out from it is a hard thing for a former wilderness ranger to to experience. I mean, I'm used to running up mountains and hardly breaking a sweat, hiking 15 miles a day with 50 pounds on my back and waking up doing it again the next day. At one point, I was even riding my bike 15 miles to work and then hiking 10 hours all day long, and then riding my bike another 15 miles back to my house at the end of the work shift. Um, so I experienced tremendous physical fitness, and to have that slip away is is tough. So so now, I mean, I, I do think, um, and, and one more thing, too, that I, I really enjoy talking about also mm-hmm. is uh, my girlfriend's daughter, uh, I've been living with her since she was five. She's nine years old now. She wasn't doing a whole lot of physical activity. And I didn't really think all that much of it because, you know, I see her kind of jumping around and wiggling around and just doing stuff that kids do and fidgeting a lot. And, you know, we did some stuff outside. We went on walks. Well, 
I, I sat down and, and I said, hey, how many sit-ups can you do? Um, and I held her feet and she tried to do a sit-up and she made it about halfway up and then she couldn't make it. And I said, oh, come on, you know, you got, no, just, you know, don't, don't wimp out on me. Do, do a sit-up. <laughs> yeah. She couldn't do it. I mean, we went through this for like 10 minutes. Like, yeah. I don't think she could have done with her if her life depended on it. Wow. And, and that kind of weakness startled me. Mm-hmm. Um, especially knowing what I know about physical fitness and weight training and all that kind of stuff. It just, I, I couldn't believe it. And so, so I, I took her and we started working out just for 10 minutes once a week with weights. Um, doing not necessarily weights, she was doing some unweighted body weight exercises like push ups and sit ups, your basic yeah. calisthenics. But I had her doing some deadlifts and some squats and some pull downs and stuff like that. And it only took her about eight months. And she's now doing, I mean, she could do 40 or 50 sit ups. She can rip off 25 push ups, slow, perfect form. Uh, which is on a nine-year-old girl is just an amazing thing to watch. Mm -hmm. She can grab 85 pounds off the floor and do 10 deadlifts with it and have, you know, and be, you know, fairly not even really that winded when she's done, which is more than her body weight. Yeah, that's pretty good. (laughs) Oh, yeah. She's, she became, and she went from the ultimate weakling to, I mean, probably the strongest nine-year-old in the county that I live in just from doing one 10 minute workout once a week for eight months. That's all it took. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take four hours a day of training to make progress. And, um, and yes, she probably could use more physical activity than that. And yes, I wish our lifestyle was set up in a way where she got more and she could benefit from more. But the fact remains that some, even a little bit, even a minuscule amount is still a a lot better than none at all. It goes a it long makes, way, right? Makes all the difference in the world. Never do none. <laughs> Always do. <laughs> Even if you make these just microscopic, you know, targets for yourself to work out, you know, one set of five different exercises once a week, it's so much better than none. And um, you just don't have to kill yourself to be physically healthy. But but in terms of physical activity, I, I still believe that we should spend quite a bit of time on our feet, walking around, going on walks, playing sports, just not sitting. Uh, it doesn't have to be working out. It should be purely for leisure and, and mm-hmm. pleasure. But we have to find a way to work in physical, just basic physicality into our daily routine somehow I do think that's a huge problem with modern life is that modern life just doesn't require us to do much of anything physically and we suffer for it. So doing some weight training and doing a variety of recreational activities and making sure that you stay in a good physiological condition in terms of your fitness and strength, if you can do that and sleep well and eat well, um, then you're going to be so much better off than the vast majority of the general public. I always say the ultimate formula or recipe for optimal, you know, the best physical function that you as an individual are capable of achieving comes from that formula of basically eat hard, sleep hard, and play hard. Um, I, actually, I kind of screwed up the order. It's eat hard, play hard, sleep hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, sleep comes last. <laughs> yes, um, it does. But yeah, that if you do those things, those three things, and you rinse and repeat, you know, you're going to be at your peak. You're going to have more muscle mass, more strength, more fitness than you would have otherwise. Your sex drive is going to work better. Your mood's going to be better. You're going to have a lot more energy and drive to do things in your career. And, um, you know, there's going to be many benefits that sort of creep into all the other areas of your life, which I know is real central to your belief system, Michael, is to, you know, to be to be well-rounded, to pay attention to all the different aspects of life and uh, good physical health with those three things, eat well, eat hard, play hard, sleep hard. If you can get those three things going for you, it's a fantastic foundation. Yeah, and, and they're synergistic too, right? And they, they sort of feed off each other. If if you're not eating properly, you're not going to be able to sleep well and you're not going to be able to you know exercise and move properly. And And that goes for all three of them. Absolutely. If you're not eating well, you're not going to, you know, your physical, 
capabilities are going to suffer. And if you don't eat well, your metabolism is going to drop and you're going to have a hell of a hard time sleeping. So, yeah, all those things work very synergistically together. You can't do two out of three. It's got to be all three, the trinity of awesomeness there. So let's give a quick recap here. We have, you know, you want to listen to your body. Give us those, uh, those, that functionality that we want to pay attention to. Run through that real quick. That would be your body temperature. You need to make sure you're 98.6 or 36 degrees Celsius at mm-hmm. rest. Anybody can jump up and down on a trampoline for 15 minutes and get their body temperature up. I'm talking about at rest. Yeah. You should feel warm all the way through the tip of your hands and feet. You should mm-hmm. tr- feel like you can go out on a cold day. Everybody's bundled up and you're in a T-shirt. You want to be radiating body heat. Mm-hmm. Okay. So warm is big. You want your bowels to be moving freely. You want to have large, easy-to-pass bowel movements without straining at least once per day and probably more like twice. Um, you, want to have, um, uh, you want to have yellow urine and not be urinating frequently. You want to be able to go long periods of time without going to the bathroom. You don't want to be the obnoxious person on a road trip who needs to stop at every fourth exit to urinate. And, um, and, and I promise you when you, when you start paying attention to that, you'll start seeing the people who are urinating frequently, who are the annoying person on the road trip. (laughs) You'll notice those people are cold, their hands, they're always freezing and all these other things. And they probably have digestive problems as well. You want to be able to sleep through the night without waking up all the Mm -hmm. way through the night. And then you want to have proper sex drive and libido and sexual function and all that. Those, mm-hmm. those, five, those are the five main ones that I think are uh, worthy of the most uh, just acknowledgement and, and, and just obser- observation on your part. Yeah, if you get, if you get those right, it's going to go a long way towards your overall health. Yeah, basic fundamentals. I know it's boring. It sounds like you know, grandma, great grandma's wisdom on, on being healthy. It's not modern and sexy. There's not an app for any of these things, but, <laughs> but ultimately these boring, basic fundamentals, they are the foundation. And if you prioritize those and you block out all the noise about, you know, meal timing and meal frequency and food combining and macrobiotics and veganism and paleo and gluten-free and all these other things, not that they don't all have a little bit of fragment of validity because they do, Mm -hmm. but ultimately they are distraction from what matters so much more than all that peripheral stuff. All that stuff's just going to distract you and take your attention and draw it away from the fundamentals. Don't do that. Always keep the fundamentals front and center in uh, any of your health practices that you're trying to implement into your life. Yeah, so so we want to pay attention to the, to the body and the functionality of the body is is what the message is here. <clears throat> Absolutely, and and make assessments, you know. If you mm-hmm. if you feel curious about trying something, try it out. Don't let me stop you, but if your body is not responding well and you're paying attention to the fundamentals of, of proper function and you're noticing declines, you better you better you better you better check yourself before you wreck yourself because that's you know you better pivot and go back to what you're doing before and uh, you know it may hurt your ego a little bit that your crazy idea that you had that you were so excited about was wrong and believe me I've been through that that kind of uh, experience many many times uh, but ultimately your body is going to tell you whether what you're doing is is helping or hurting and I, I think you'll find that most of the health ideas out there that you try to implement are going to have an adverse effect, not a positive effect on those those basic areas that we that we talked about. Yeah, very very good, very good information here. Okay, um, is there is there anything else you have to say about health before we really dig into the the entrepreneurial side of things here? Well, I mean, I could I could say a lot more, but I just I don't really feel compelled to anymore because again just like i said i don't want to talk about you know inflammation and different fatty acids and uh you know all these different things because we could talk about matters of nutritional minutia all day long we could talk about amino acid profiles and uh you know what 
you should get your protein sources from what is ideal. Well, we could talk about all that stuff all day long, but ultimately I, it's more important to me that people are refocused on the basics, that they don't get wrapped up mm -hmm. in all that, uh, all that sort of nutritional lore. Uh, those basics are more important, so I think it's more appropriate to, to just leave it off there. Yeah, one thing I'd like to cover real quick that uh, you didn't really touch upon is the is how stress factors in with dieting and you know tr trying to be too precise with your diet and too concerned about everything that you're eating talk talk about how stress stress uh, is a factor well you know stress is a a broad idea it yeah. is obviously when we think about stress we think about oh we got deadlines to meet or you know there's financial troubles on the horizon or you know difficult breakup we think of that psychological stress anxiety worry that's what we think of when we hear stress but the true physiological meaning of stress and that that framework is basically stress is anything that elicits the production of stress hormones in the body stress hormones like the glucocorticoids cortisol uh, some of our other sort of adrenaline type of class uh, stress hormones that we produce. Mm -hmm. That's anything that can elicit uh, an increased production of those things could be to, could be called a stress. And there's so many different things that, that cause that. Um, I think stress gets a little bit of a bad rap sometimes because we need stress. Like I talked about, because I, I haven't been outside physically moving my body around, I go out on a short walk and my feet hurt. Well, why is that? Because I haven't been putting my feet under enough stress. Mm -hmm. And the stress itself, if you recover from it properly, is actually the catalyst to becoming stronger. Just, just like in any form of exercise, you stress your muscles out, you provide yourself with a very difficult physical challenge. And if you let yourself properly recuperate from that, when you go to do that the next time, you will be stronger than you were the time before. So it is good for us to have physiological stress. It's good for us to have mental stress. We need mental challenges. We need emotional challenges. We need those things. They do make us stronger. But so many people are subjecting themselves to more stress than they can recuperate from. Mm-hmm chronic stress, stress that is long lasting, that is hours and hours per day. And we eventually will break down. A lot of people use this kind of lame metaphor for stress, and I've used it too, of just getting a sunburn, right? You know, if you go out and you get a little bit of sun on your skin, your skin gets darker. And next time you go out in the sun, you can stay out longer before you start to get sunburned. That's how your skin gets stronger. It gets adapted to being outside in that environment where the sun is shining. And if you go out there for too long and you go way beyond the threshold of what you're adapted for, you get a severe sunburn and your skin will actually become a lot more sensitive to the sun, not stronger. Mm -hmm. So we always have to think of thresholds. And, you know, it, it just depends. A lot of people, I think, are not stressed enough. Their life is very leisurely. They're not doing any physical activity. They zone out in front of the television where their minds are not subjected to any kind of stress. They're just basically there staring away like zombies. The average American watches something like four hours a day of television. And I'm sure when they're not watching television, they're looking at their phones or watching something on the Internet. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are not nearly stressed enough. And then there are people who are way overburdened who are working too hard you know i hear the scenario all the time and like grad students and people like that yeah. who are going through really difficult stuff with their studies they're staying up they're not getting enough sleep um they're living off of energy drinks and you know movie candy and uh they're just not they're breaking down and there's nothing there to allow them to rebuild and come back stronger. So as long as you appreciate the fact that for every time you subject yourself to a difficult stress, you need to recuperate and replenish before you go back at it again, then I think that's a recipe for getting progressively stronger over time. Um, the rest of us, you know, 
need to definitely watch out and make sure that we're not, especially people living, listening to this, I would think are, are people that are really wanting to become great achievers in their lifetime. Yeah. You know, you really have to, you really have to keep an eye on it. And, you know, the older you get too, the, the harder it is to recuperate. You know, I can't do as much mental work as I used to. I used to just 14 hours a day, you know, no problem. Um, I can't do that kind of stuff anymore. So, you know, you just have to make sure that you're, you're tuning into that. And, and the last thing you need is stress over what you're eating and how you're combining your foods and whether you ate too much or you ate too little, or I ate that brownie and I said I wasn't going to, and then I feel really guilty about it and stress. I think that's kind of what you were hinting at. Yeah, exactly. Um, Creating all of this anxiety about eating, where, whereas eating should be this nourishing, you know, healthy experience. Absolutely. I mean, you have to incorporate that sort of no drama way of eating. Um, you can't attach all these emotions to, to food choices that you make. And for me, and I'm sorry we didn't get a little bit more time to talk about specifically, but for me, that was a real turning point. Because mm -hmm. like I said, in my teenage years, I was constantly trying to eat as little as possible and then binging and then feeling really guilty. And then I was like hating myself for doing it. And, and I would devise all these forms of sick punishment <laughs> to, to um, you know, basically absolve myself of, of, of having committed this, this heinous crime against what I set out to do. So, you know, I was, you know, forcing myself to do more and more challenging physical feats um, using exercise as punishment for my dietary wrongdoings. And I would, you know, do lots of dietary things as punishment. You know, mm -hmm. if I ate, a, you know, the whole time I was eating the Krispy Kreme donuts, I'd be thinking, okay, I'm not going to eat these again. You know, tomorrow's the new day and I'm going to go and I'm going to go to the grocery store after this and buy, you know, all these organic greens and I'm going to have salad. Every, I mean, just... And it got just increasingly irrational as well. I mean, it just got crazy. I mean, the the kind of demands or the kind of sick, weird ways of eating that I thought that I was going to be able to endure mm -hmm. um, just got more and more extreme. And uh, it was an escalation process. And I finally, thankfully, reached a point, point where um, I, I couldn't escalate anymore. And I had to figure out another way. And that other way was basically to just be at peace with myself and my eating. If I was hungry, if I had a craving for Krispy Kremes, I would eat Krispy Kremes and then I would think back and try to figure out what made me so ravenously hungry or what made me stressed out and compelled to go eat something like that. Mm -hmm. And usually it was because I didn't sleep enough or I exercised too hard or you know something, something happened. There was always a reason for it and I realized that my body was being intelligent. It was trying to save itself. It was trying to shut down my stress hormones by compelling me to eat foods like that because foods like that, you know, they, they shut those stress hormones off immediately and make you want to go take a nap. So, um, anyway, there's always a reason for it. And, uh, you know, just not constantly having that mental chatter about, Oh, was this good? Is this bad? How much arachidonic acid is, is in this? Is that going to make me inflamed? Is this, should I combine this and this? I heard about, combining these two things, causing digestive problems. Oh, I mean, is there sugar in this? How much sugar is in this? How much of it is fructose? Because I heard that that can lead to, you know, fatty liver. And I mean, there's just so much craziness out there that thinking about what you're eating like that has become more of a liability than just eating junk food. I mean, yeah, even if you're eating the healthiest diet in the world and you're, you know, you're freaking out about it, you're anxious about it, it's going to it's going to be self-defeating in the long run. Yeah, because like I said, a lot of people are already too stressed. Their total stress burden is way too high already. Mm -hmm. And to add additional psychological stress revolving around eating, which happens multiple times per day, every day, is, uh, is really, really rough to have to endure. And eating and sleeping are really the by far the most... The, the best tools that we have for recuperation from stress itself. These are the two major anti-stress activities that we use to recharge our batteries 
and recuperate and replenish ourselves when we're, you know, out working and, and doing things that are physically and mentally straining. So uh, anyway, you, you're not only cheating yourself, you're not only causing stress, but you're cheating yourself of one of your best anti-stress mm -hmm. uh, tools that you have available to you. So it's about it's about maintaining the balance and allowing yourself to really be nourished by the food, right? By the diet. Yeah, I mean, nourished is good. Uh, one of the first things I set out to do was just try to eat as take in as many nutrients as I possibly could. So I would just try to eat as much nutritious food as I could possibly stuff in me every day, which for me, having tried to eat as little food as possible for so long, a decade that was an incredible shift of focus to go from eating as little as possible to as much as possible. It was made a huge difference and I actually got leaner doing that almost instantly. Um, cause that's just kind of what happens when you're really bombarding yourself with a lot of nourishment and doing it consistently. Um, it's great for your metabolism. Your metabolism rises from eating well and eating enough and not going long periods of time without food, not getting ravenously hungry, mm -hmm. things start working better. Your body starts starts burning energy and consuming energy at the optimal rate, and then everything starts functioning better. And that's uh, that's kind of what I'm what I'm getting at. Yeah. So let's while you know we're going in that direction, let's talk. Let's cover the the refeeding that you do. You know, you've you've helped people recover from dieting. What 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 do you have people do with that? Well, like I said, it's it's proper to get adequate calories. And if your metabolism is low and you've been under eating for a long period of time and you've actually seen that your body temperature is low, you're freezing cold all the time, maybe your bowels aren't working, you're failing and all those you're, – you're bringing home a bad report card. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes it takes a prolonged – um, refeeding process. I call it rest and refeeding because, mm -hmm. you know, I am a big advocate of getting proper sleep as well with it. And the idea is basically just to eat and sleep as much as possible until your metabolism is completely recuperated. And it's a difficult process because most people gain fat during that process. Um, but during that process, everything starts functioning optimally underneath. The libido comes back, the digestion starts functioning properly again, the teeth get hard and strong and white, the skin becomes moist, you know, your hair and nails start growing faster, all these peripheral signs and symptoms and that, that you're functioning better take place as you start to go through this rest and refeeding process. And when you're done, you can slowly get back into good physical condition with exercise. You can lose a lot of people, especially young people will lose all the body fat they gain completely spontaneously without doing anything. Mm -hmm. They just eat to appetite, exercise when they feel like it, and over a period of several months or a year, all the body fat that they might have gained goes away completely, and they end up actually looking more muscular and lean than they did before they went on that sort of fattening, refeeding process. So anyway, that's that's a little bit uh, about that. But that's uh, you know if you if you're listening to this right now, and you hear me talking about cold hands and feet, urinating frequently, your digestion moving slow, inability to sleep, maybe peeing frequently, a tendency towards feeling anxiety. If you're experiencing all those things and your body temperature is low, uh, there, that is just exactly what you need. And it will be the most powerful medicine that you've ever, ever found to go through that refeeding process. Now, there's a lot of people who don't need it, but think that they do because they're healthaholics, but there's people mm -hmm. who genuinely need it. And if you can verify that you're underperforming in all those areas, then, you know, I got, I got just what you need, um, <laughs> it, with my information on how to go through that refeeding process successfully and, and how to do that. Yeah. And that, that's actually what I'm going through right now. Um, so let's, we're coming up on an hour here. Um, and we were, you know, the conversation has kind of gotten to the point of once you recover and you become healthy, then, you know, what do you do with your life? You know, you've reached this point where, you know, our conversation yesterday, you were talking about how you don't even like really talking about health anymore. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's true. Like I said, I, I like I think the fundamentals are important, but you know, at this point, I've gone through that healthaholism phase. I am a recovering healthaholic. Yeah. And I'm I'm really glad to have come through that that phase, not be obsessed with health anymore, not be looking up and down the spines on all my breakfast cereals like I did as a kid and basically eat and, and you know, is a fairly nutritious, healthy diet, but it doesn't run my life anymore. Yeah, you're not living to be healthy. You're you're healthy so that you can live, right? Right, right. And channeling all that energy into other things. You know, I'm getting back into backpacking, not as self punishment for a Krispy Kreme binge, (laughs) but getting back into it because it's genuinely fun. Taking my family out to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm going out and uh, you know I'm doing a lot of things. I started several new businesses in 2014. And, uh, you know, I've got a lot of new endeavors going on there and that's just going phenomenally well. I put a lot of energy towards that and that's going great. Um, you know, and I have great aspirations to do some other things in the future. My, uh, my girlfriend and and her daughter were talking about going out and, and, you know, maybe, maybe starting a farm and doing some things there, not because we're health fanatics and we're afraid to eat processed food, Mm -hmm. It just sounds like a fun thing to do, and it sounds like what we need because we we want to be physical and we want to have physical chores that we have to go tend to so that we yeah. stay physically fit and flexible and mobile. Um, and and we like we all feel better outside. My girlfriend has epilepsy, and and you wouldn't believe how profoundly better her epilepsy is when she's spending time outside. And doing things outdoors as opposed to sitting around and, and working on the computer and, and, you know, stuff like that. That's just yeah. <laughs> bright flashing lights on the computer all day. It's just not not good for her. But being outside and doing those kinds of things. So so we have lots of things, uh, you know, that, and aspirations and the things that we're focused on that, um, that are going to deliver a lot more in the long term than just sitting around thinking about, you know, whether I'm eating uh, – too much tryptophan in proportion to my to my glycine or whatever yeah, <laughs> nutritional yeah. minutia that I might have been hyper focused on at one point in time. Yeah, so let's let's talk about now. You know, you've built up 180 degree health, and you you said you've been working on some other things as well. Let's talk about that. Well, I, you know, I I really like that that you titled this the effective man. You know, be, and and that you're focused on all these different areas of life and and what it means to be an effective man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I like all that, and I think I have things to offer on on the career side as well. Um, I've always always had this just inability to do things that I didn't want to do, and. Um, you know, I, that's how I ended up working as a wilderness ranger. I didn't do that for the money. Are you kidding me? That was something that I did because I thought that was, you know, really fun. I couldn't possibly go and do any kind of work that I didn't enjoy. So, you know, I was a, an incredible worker as a, as a wilderness ranger. I went above and beyond the call of duty because it was fun. That's what I wanted to be doing. I was in the throes of passion doing what I exactly what I wanted to do and feeling very fortunate that I was doing that. Mm-hmm. Later on, I got really interested in uh, in cooking, and so I started working at restaurants. I traveled all around the country trying to work at the best restaurants I could possibly work at, and I, you know, got hired on the spot every time because it was just absolutely obvious that I was overflowing with this eager enthusiasm and hunger for knowledge. And that's what people want. They want to work with people. They want to hire people who are overflowing with interest and confidence and enthusiasm. Obviously, you're going to be much better at whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so, so that's kind of what – that's been a big message of mine that I've tried to share with people any chance I got as well, which is um, you know, to really try to immerse yourself in something that you love build up skills and abilities in that area mm-hmm. and and then those things those skills and abilities as you accumulate enough of it and expertise that becomes valuable it can't not become valuable and people will get a lot farther and much faster doing what they love with as much enthusiasm and vigor as they can possibly bring to it 
than trying to do what they think is smart and trying to force themselves to kind of do something that they don't really like. And I feel, you know, obviously really strong about that. And I achieved it in multiple different ways at this point in my life and had multiple successes just following what I really wanted to do and, Mm -hmm. and doing it as hard as I knew how to do it. And, um, I, I think part of being an effective man is, is basically finding a way to live the life that you really want to live to me what's painful to me is that I'm I'm getting kind of off track, but what's painful to me is that, you know, I grew up seeing my dad just work all the time Mm -hmm. and he was a workaholic and my mom didn't like that. And she felt a little bit, um, you know, kind of lonely because my dad was off immersed in this completely different world yeah, and didn't have a whole lot of time and attention for her. And I, I, I witnessed this and I got it in my mind that, that work was bad and that we should all try to spend as much of our lives as possible on vacation. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I did. Uh, I've only, I only worked, um, I, I've never worked for more than six months full time continuously in my life. Never. Um, I'll be 37 next month and, um, Actually, by the time you guys listen to this, I'll probably be 37. <laughs> so uh, 37 years old and never in my life have I ever had a full-time job continuously for six months or longer. Um, and the reason is because my ideology was that we should be recreating. I used every penny that I saved up to go on adventures, to go travel around the world, to go you know, backpacking in the the wilderness for a couple of months and just do things to that to me were fun, adventurous things. Um, and and I got sick of doing that, and um, I really got worn out and tired of repeating that again and again. Because ultimately, we, f- I, I think, to be an effective man and to feel f- genuine fulfillment we have to make some kind of progress and we have to be able to, you know, be able to contribute somehow. I think it's essential. And, um, and to be able to cultivate skills and abilities that other people that you can help other people with. Um, I think it's essential. You can't just recreate your life away and expect to feel satisfaction from that. So, so to me, that's, that's kind of part of that. And, um, you know, on, you know, from what I've done in my life, um, basically just going and doing exactly what I wanted and doing it really hard. I'd never felt like I was working, but I became very, very successful at multiple things that I've done. And, um, and and that's led me to where I am now, which is, you know, uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to have a good year uh, financially, that's for sure. <laughs> for the first time ever, I'm going to make you know some serious money this year. And, um, and I'm getting to the point where I'm not really having to do a whole lot of work. Like I said, I'm thinking about moving out to the farm and living yeah. easy, <laughs> doing some other things. I'm always going to be um, – I don't, I don't want to be bored ever. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not necessarily about the money. Um, anyway, what, what do you have to say about that? I know you have some passionate thoughts about that too. Well, I mean, what I'd like to hear is, you know, you've, you've been successful in building up this, you know, this empire of yours, uh, the Matt Stone empire. Um, I'm sure you have some, some tips for for people that, uh, you know, they could learn from your mistakes and, what was effective for you in that whole process? Well, if we're just talking about, um, let's say, you know, your own business, mm-hmm. um, you know, first of all, I, I do feel like it's just so easy. Of course, from my perspective, I look and I see people who are not doing something entrepreneurial, and I just think that they must be insane because it, to <laughs> me, to me, it's so easy to do it. It's so much easier to do that. Yeah. Like I said, I was never very good in school. I got okay grades. I'm not, you know, I'm not stupid. But I just I just wasn't passionate about it. I didn't go very far with it. Competing against other people head to head in academics, um trying to get some job and outcompete 
30 other people with the, you know, with my resume in the corporate world, that never would have happened. Um, it just wasn't my forte, but going the entrepreneurial route, um, wow, it's easy. Now, I didn't know it was easy because nobody <laughs> knows how easy it is until they've done it. Yeah. At first, it seems daunting. It seems very difficult. It seems nebulous. It seems like a fantasy. And yeah. um, so I started out, like I said, reading and writing and researching. And I, I blogged for a while and just put my stuff online, waiting for the world to discover what a genius I am. And um, <laughs> I, I, I got a few followers that found me, and I wrote a book and sold it to them. And, you know, I thought, you know, I was doing okay, but I was, uh, I was on year three of doing it and I only made about $4,000 in year three of being a health researcher and writer. Mm -hmm. Um, the year after that, um, you know, I think I made it up, uh, a little over 20,000 and was feeling a little better about, better about things. But again, we're at year four here. Yeah. Uh, year five, I got up to around 40,000. So, you know, a pretty respectable sort of survival salary. I mean, anybody in the world can live off of 40000 a year. Yeah. Uh, but, but it took me five years to do that. And, um, and the reason it took me so long was that I was basically this one-man island. And what I mean by a one-man island is that I was, I was kind of just doing my own thing and I wasn't going out and making connections with people. Uh, particularly people who were also in my field doing what I was doing, who had followings built up, who had audiences built up. Uh, you know, there's so many ways that I could have connected with those people and that could have accelerated my success. But I really, I just really didn't do it. I kind of just played the one man island thing and wrote my thoughts out and wrote some books and sold it to that small following of people that I had. And I got to a point of reasonable success, but it wasn't really till I realized how easy it is to sort of network with people and accelerate your success that, um, that I really started to have much more genuine levels of success. And, and a, a, my, actually a real world example is for example, uh, at the very beginning of 2014, uh, my partner and I, who started out as my assistant working with um, my health website that I had, I, I helped him start his own publishing company, his own business. Mm -hmm. Again, I think he was very daunted about the, the entrepreneur role. And, um, you know, it was a little bit much for him to handle, but I could see it so clearly. Now, hey, you, you have skills, you learn how to publish on Amazon, and you learn how to do all these things. Hey, you know, this is a great service to authors. You really should start your own business, man. This is going to be a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if he necessarily saw it. And I don't know if I even saw how successful um, that it really could be. I mean, I saw, but I didn't know the whole path, but I just yeah. knew that there was something there. And, you know, it's not like we were just a one man island and we were writing um, blog posts about you know, how you should publish books on Kindle and how successful you can be doing it. Instead, what I did, and this is exactly what I did, um, I sent two emails to two of the top people in the independent publishing community. These are people who had amassed a following of people who were learning the tips and tactics for successfully self-publishing online. Mm -hmm. So these guys were these guys were in communication with hundreds, thousands, thousands of authors and aspiring authors. Yeah. And so I sent an email to them. And one of the things that we were doing that, that they hadn't been doing is making audiobooks. So we did uh, some uh, free audiobook for one of them. And overnight, he got to see that he got to list the book over there. It started uh, selling. And then all of a sudden, he, we were just getting bombarded with audiobook projects. And these audiobook projects were doing for, you know, anywhere from $300 to $1,000. And we were getting just dozens and dozens. So we went from basically zero revenue to, you know, $10,000 plus of revenue, $20,000 of revenue. Um, you know, we, we did that in a matter of weeks, really. I mean, it was... It was that fast. All we had to do was have the courage to go out 
and communicate with the right people. And and most importantly, we we had a service to offer. Mm-hmm. We were doing something cool to help people with the with the skills and knowledge that that Rob had developed. We went and offered that to people for free as a favor to demonstrate how great it is. And then they went and told everybody how great we are. That's that's it. That's it. That's how that's I built it. I tell people I built a successful business with two emails. And that is not the least bit of an exaggeration because obviously there was this long process of developing skills and abilities. But when it ca- came time to take those skills and abilities to market, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was a piece of cake. Um, I could think of lots of other examples like that. And, and I have another business, which is a book promotion website. It's gone from non-existent um, until May 30th of 2014. That's when we started it. Yeah, talk and, about how you built that up. Yeah, it's called Buck Books, and uh, it's already the second largest book promotion website in the world. And, um, you know, we're still a ways from number one, but we certainly got our site set on it. And I don't think it's going to take much more than a year or a year and a half to get there. But um, again, we just started, um, I started networking with people and getting people to drive traffic over to one site. And what it was doing was helping them sell their books. So I was offering a service to them. I didn't charge them anything for it. And the result is that they sold more books. Mm-hmm. And in in doing so and getting them all to congregate in the same place and drive traffic all to the same spot, I was able to get a bunch of email subscribers. And uh, those email subscribers, in turn, we were offering uh, were offering discount books to. So so the general public loves it because they're getting all these great books that normally are $10 for 99 cents. Yeah. And the authors love it because they're, they sell all these books and with the way Amazon works, the algorithm goes, is, is set in a way that, um, you get, you're ranked based, based on the number of downloads. It doesn't matter what price it is. Mm-hmm. So if you sell 10 books at 99 cents and then some other guy sells one book at 9.99, you guys brought in the same amount of revenue, but the 99 cent book is blowing up all the bestseller lists. Yeah. And so what happens is we they get an improvement and uh, in their ranking and then they set their price back to 9.99 and they get more 9.99 purchases for 3 to 5 weeks typically after the promotion has ended. Mhm. So, so we're helping them make a lot more money. We're not charging them anything for it. Uh, readers get to get all these great books for cheap, and uh, you know, basically pr- put a good service out there. And um, it's just amazing how quickly and easily it's come together. And the reason we started it was just to help better sell the books that we were publishing for the the gigs that we were getting through our publishing company, Archangel Inc. And now I'm getting. You know, I've gotten, I think, five podcast invites in the last like four days. Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting all these other people uh, wanting to do favors for us, like promote our services and promote us, promote our publishing services and all kinds of things, drive traffic to our website. They're wanting to do all these things for us because we did something for them. And that's it. And I, I told my uh, one of the guys that I work with uh, today, I said, it's amazing how easy it is to to have a successful business when you do something that can benefit others and then you go and tell people about it that's mm-hmm. it that's that's how we build a successful business do something that is uh beneficial to others and go tell them about it that's it that's the formula for a successful business and um you know i think we're probably going to be um in the the one to two million dollar range in terms of revenue this year with a business that we started for two hundred dollars it's very impressive <laughs> yeah yeah it's been it's and it's only going to take you know this is going to be that we're talking about months 12 through 24 of our our business here and um and it, it's just really a lot of fun it's it's really it's really easy and um the time to start building those skills and expertise and knowledge and and just whatever unique thing that you're interested in um, is now. I mean, spend your free time not just watching whatever came in on Netflix, but spend your free time really in growth, you know, just immersing yourself in your area of interest. 
whatever that might be. It could be playing guitar. It could be um, all kinds of different things. I have a friend of mine who's really passionate about grass. I mean, mm-hmm. people often have the most peculiar interests that they just for some reason have been interested in all their lives. I have one guy who's just obsessed with embalming bodies who's a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. He's known since he was like 10 years old that that's what he was going to do with his life. Um, so everybody's got those unique interests and passions. And if you go and actually apply yourself towards that, um, you'll just find that you thrive. And um, as soon as you start making progress, too, even long before you ever make your first dollar uh, from the skills and knowledge you develop, you'll already be much happier because you'll see the progress that you're making. You'll feel progress. And to me, progress is the key to feeling satisfied, knowing that you're moving forward and moving in the right direction. That gives you that optimism you need. That gives you the energy to do what you need to do today Mm -hmm. to get there and uh, sort of solves a lot of, of issues. And for me, the biggest is that it keeps me from dwelling on stuff that I'm not really that interested in. You know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, you know, talking with people and having conversations about movies and, um, you know, what's going on in the news. Like, I'm just not distracted by any of that stuff. I'm not sharing, you know, personal drama about my relationships and things like that with other people. I just don't have time to care about that because Mm -hmm. I, I, I have this that is filled all that space. And, um, I'm just not the petty things in life just completely faded into the background, like background noise. Once I, once I found and latched onto and started applying myself towards something and and started feeling that progress taking place. So progress is very important to you, Matt. Do you have any sort of strategy for maintaining progress? Um, well, the biggest thing is just to keep keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had, um, you know, I, I mentioned how slow it was for me when I started 180 degree health, and you know, my my fourth year, my third year was like I think I said four thousand earlier, but it was I think it was more like six, and then the second year was a little over twenty thousand. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend at the time was going nuts. I mean, she yeah. was like, "What you're doing is not working. You need to do something else. You need to get a job. You need to blah blah blah." And I'm like, "I just grew by like 350 percent in sales. Went up 350 percent over the last year." Yeah. Um, to me, I was like amazed by the progress. Mm-hmm. You know, and I had gotten to the point where I was making almost two thousand dollars a month. I mean, I was making enough to where I could. I could kind of survive. I mean, my my credit card balances were still getting progressively larger, but at a much, much slower pace. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I could see, I could see in the future that it was eventually going to get there. I knew that I was making progress and Mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about money because I knew it was right around the corner. I wasn't worried about what I'm going to do with my life when I grow up or any of that kind of stuff because I felt like I knew exactly where I was headed. And all those those questions that cause us so much fear and anxiety were answered for me, and um, that drove me nuts. And um, you know, I'm not not with that particular girlfriend anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> so it sounds like you didn't actually have any sort of long term plan for you. It was just a matter of sticking with it and continuing to move forward, right? Never. I mean, the only reason I did it is because I wanted to. Yeah. I, I didn't do it with any other goal in mind. I knew that I was interested in health and nutrition, so I immersed myself in it. And if you just do that, you will develop valuable skills and knowledge. And as you do, you'll be able to cash in on that value because your skills, services, and expertise will be in demand <clears throat> once you've reached a certain level. Mm-hmm. And... um yeah, I mean, the success I, I eventually had publishing and selling my books as an author that took me all these years to accumulate is what's made me an authority in the indie publishing world, which is what's made our publishing company become such an instant success. Again, I didn't set out to start a publishing company. I didn't set out to do anything but just read a bunch of books and, and share my thoughts about it on a blog. 
Um, I, it started out as purely a hobby. And what was cool about it, too, is that obviously when I started, I had to work a regular job. And so many people are dissatisfied with what they're doing for work. And I was dissatisfied at the time, too. And then I started making just – I started – to have a little more clarity about what I was doing and where I was headed. Mm -hmm. I started to see some progress. You know, I started to see my traffic slowly going up and I started to get a few comments and I saw the progress taking place. And I immediately, it was like I was, it was like I was sending my twin to work for me. <laughs> um, it's emotionally, I just, I wasn't even really there and nothing at work could bring me down or frustrate me because I had already, I was already on to the next thing, even though I was still there. So my dissatisfaction yeah. with work immediately disappeared. And the thing for me is that when you're doing what you love doing, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Because you're, you're doing what you like to do with as much of your free time as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's that you already have a great life getting money for that down the line and being, you know, having financial wealth is, I mean, that's just an, that's just an after effect. That's just a bonus. Happiness is from spending your life doing what you want to be doing. Um, obviously money and having financial riches can enable us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, fly around the world and travel and, you know, go 150 miles an hour in the Audubon with a Mercedes or whatever. <laughs> These are not things that I personally care about. Um, like I said, I'll probably be milking goats or something with my financial wealth. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, to me, it's not, that's never been a motivating factor. I've never been motivated by money. Um, I just always wanted to be spending my time doing what I wanted to be doing. And, and, and I, now I'm reaping so many rewards from that. I've re I've reaped rewards all along the way because I've been happy and, um, and I've gone everywhere I wanted to go and I've lived everywhere I wanted to live. I lived in Maui. I lived in, you know, Jackson, Wyoming and skied the Tetons and stuff like that. I mean, I, I lived in all over the place, I've traveled all over the world. And, um, you know, I've, I fulfilled all those things along the way and it was fun. And just because I'm sort of peaking a little bit late in the financial department doesn't doesn't really make much difference to me. But you know, I'm now I'm ready for it, and I am a little bit more interested in it because I'm in a different phase now. I'm a little bit more passionate about it, whereas I wasn't passionate about it then. And um, now that I am, it it comes quite easily because everything that I've ever done, if I was really doing what I wanted to do and loving life. Everything always came easily. It was when I tried to do things I didn't want to do that I ran into obstacles that I couldn't overcome, you know. So it really is just about figuring out what you want to do and doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, it's the hardest part, I think, is figuring out what you want to do. And um, a lot of times that that slowly, you know, you slowly get clarity on that. You don't always know before you do it. Yeah, it's not an overnight process. And, you know, you, you talked about all of the things that you've, you've done in the past, you, it seems like you experimented a lot, right? Well, it's not that I experimented. It's just that I had, I, everybody's always diff interested in different things at different times. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, first it was backpacking, then it was cooking, and then it was, uh, I was really interested in skiing for a while too. I didn't mention that, but I was, uh, I was kind of, uh, in the back of my mind thought that maybe I could be uh, a competitive mogul skier for a while, but my body, my body broke down yeah. um, under, under my attempts to, to prepare myself for such a thing. Um, and then I got interested in, um, you know, after cooking, I get interested in health and nutrition and then I did that. And, um, and now I'm a little bit more interested in just publishing and the mm -hmm. publishing industry, and I, I'm loving that. And internet business is sort of tied in there and married to that as well with the way I have things set up. But, you know, the next things could be, you know, farming. I mean, who knows? But the fact of the matter is that if you follow that, you're, you're always going to be happy because what you want your life to be and what it is will always be close together. Um, what's hard is when you want to be living at the farm or doing something else and you're stuck in a cubicle 
or vice versa. You're milking the cows every day and you're ready to off yourself because it's so, to you, it's not exciting and fun and mundane. You have no passion for it anymore and you want to escape. Um, Because anybody can be wildly happy milking a cow or absolutely suicidally miserable. It just depends on what depends on what you want to be doing and how closely aligned that is to actually what you want to be doing. And to me, I've always just, I, I can't, if my life gets too far away from what I want it to be, I I just go insane. I can't, I can't do it. And it served me well that it's been so dominant that I have to, I just have this force in me that drives me to go do what I want to do. I can't, I, I just can't, settle for less. And because I haven't settled for less, I've gotten to go through all these experiences and see how really truly easy it is to be successful, kind of doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I can change and pivot anytime and go be successful in that area because I realize now that, that being successful, doing your own thing, whatever that own thing may be, it's not difficult. It might be a little bit more risky, but it's not difficult. And I've never met anybody that starved to death because things didn't work out for them. Never. Never did they follow some passion and I'm going to go do this. And they ended up starving, running out of food supplies because they just couldn't make ends meet. I mean, we live in a society that has all these <laughs> these things that, that the worst case scenario is not that bad Yeah. if things go wrong. most Most of us have you know, nice parents and big houses that we can go live in. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that's like the worst case scenario. And I even did go and live with my mom for a few months when I was doing my 180 degree health thing. And I was just developing that. Yeah. Um, So I don't know our safety nets in today's society are so undaunting that you might as well just go for it. Uh, Worst case scenario is you declare bankruptcy and, you know, have to eat canned food or something like that, which is, you know, just a lot better than the worst case scenario a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. All the fear that people might have these days about, you know, becoming an an entrepreneur, like you're saying, there's really not, there's not much to fear. You know, the, the idea of failure, it's not that bad. If, even if you do fail. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to be able to, to get paid to do what you love, even if it's a, just a little bit, it's better than being ridiculously wealthy and having to do something you hate all day long every day. At least I think that's becoming a more common sentiment in today's generation. Our younger generations don't – they yeah, they want to be wealthy, but living the life that you love and doing the things that you want is, is more valuable than the dollar now. Yeah, it, it seems to be a trend these days. People seem to realize that's, that money isn't the answer. I mean, you know, it's obviously a factor in happiness and all of that, but it's not the answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I like money a lot. It, it's great. <laughs> and it's, well, it's, you know, not because I can buy like BMWs with it, but because, um, you know, money is, is fun. You can take your ideas and turn them into reality if you have money. If you have a million dollars in your pocket and you have a good idea for some consumer product, Um, you know, a kid's toy or something, you can go and and bring that into the world and take it to market. Boom. Because that's money can do that. It's fun. Um, But, you know, once you've fed yourself and clothed yourself and housed yourself and had a little extra money for, you know, a little travel and some things like that, there's really not a whole lot else that it can do for you that's going to make a substantial difference in your overall quality of life. At least... Maybe maybe if I had fifty million in my bank account, I could give a more informed opinion about that. <laughs> but for my current state, that's that's how I feel about it. Maybe for the the effective man uh, version five, let's say you can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by hopefully by number five, I'll I'll report, <laughs> I'll I'll swoop in a report on what it's like to have fifty million dollars, and it really <laughs> is a whole heck of a lot better than having uh, you know a hundred. 100,000 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, Well, Matt, I think you've shared some powerful information here on this talk. I think this talk alone is is going to be worth it for the listeners to hear. Um, 
Is there anything else here that you want to talk about? No, that's good. I mean, hopefully that, uh, you know, we kind of went over some of the health things that I, I've encountered that could be of use to people so that they don't sort of go down that rabbit hole and waste a bunch of years of their lives. I mean, that's that's one thing I know you. that's why you wanted to bring me on uh, yeah. to sort of help keep people from going down the wrong avenue and also to help give them some insights on what the foundation of health is yeah. so that they can have that base foundation of good function so that they're not distracted by health problems and they can go and fulfill other objectives that they've set out to fulfill. Um, you know, and the third, of course, you know, providing a little insight uh, on, you know, an inspiration and motivation to, to have the courage to go out and and fulfill your dreams and follow those whims that you have and, and follow the excitement of life without, you know, being so worried, worried about the, the negative outcomes that may come of it. You know, hopefully, hopefully we got a little bit of that injected into some of these listeners as well. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. I think that was, you, you covered a lot there in the, on the entrepreneurial side of things. That was, there was a lot of solid information there. Yeah, well, do, you know, find something that you that you think sounds cool to be doing and spending your days doing and, uh, and get good at it and then go tell people about it. That's all you have to do. And it's never been easier to connect with other people and tell them about it than it is now. So Yeah, tell them on the Internet, right? <laughs> yeah, tell them on the Internet. Don't tell individuals like your friends and family. Go tell people who have, you know, 8,000 blog hits a day uh, about what you do. Um and they'll then they'll tell everybody about it and save you a lot of time of having to do, go door to door. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, Matt. I think this is this has been a great conversation. Well, good. I hope it's a value to everybody listening. And uh, thanks for having me, Michael. It's a cool event that you're putting on. And, uh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being a part of it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Matt. my prior beliefs if I come across a point of view that is superior and more um, evolved in its understanding. And, and that's the process that I've gone through. It's been a process of personal development. And in that process, you know, I've, I've become uh, my information that I disseminate has become more and more valuable because I have grown past those early stages of thinking naively and, and thinking, you know, really primitively about what we should eat and drink and nutrition in general. And, uh, you know, I don't know, we'll, we'll discuss all that, I'm sure. And, and people will kind of understand hopefully what I mean by that. But. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, before we get into, I guess, where you at, where you're at now with health, let's talk about your whole journey and the struggles that you've went through and sort of some lessons that you learned from that. Well, I see so many people repeat through the same series of, uh, the same sequence that yeah, I exactly. did. So yeah, so hopefully people can actually learn from that and not make those same mistakes, right? <laughs> exactly, and uh, that's what I hope everyone gets out of listening to this conversation. Now, yeah. the first thing, like I said, I became just interested in being proactive about my health. I mm -hmm. think it's a good thing. I think there's a lot of people out there that that take a look around and they know that something is awry. Yeah, there's a lot of unhealthy people. There's a lot of grossly overweight people. It something about it really seems unhealthy and we know that there's something about our modern diet yeah. and lifestyle that is not ideal mm -hmm. and um you know at first we kind of buy into the everyday logic that people are just eating too much and and not getting enough exercise and that's why they don't feel well and they suffer and um you know that's kind of how i thought originally and, uh, you know, people who were fat were just a bunch of lazy bums. And, and so I started off in my teens just trying to do more exercise and charting my progress and writing down how many push-ups I did and sit-ups I did and all these kinds of things mm -hmm. into a, a calendar and keeping track of all that. I also started becoming proactive about my food intake. So obviously nobody could ever possibly be, you know, lean and ripped enough. And so I was always constantly, perpetually trying to eat as little as I could stand. And that was one of the first big mistakes that I made. And the consequences of that were basically that I was always eating, trying to eat a perfect Spartan health food diet or trying to not really eat much at all. 
and then I would get progressively hungrier throughout the day. Yeah. And then I would end up stuffing my face with a bunch of foods that I thought were unhealthy because my cravings had built up throughout the day so strongly. Um, in addition to that, the amount of exercise that I was doing was on a, an upward trajectory as well. So what started out with a few push-ups and sit-ups, you know, my bedroom as a teenager, that later changed to 100-mile bike rides and 500-mile bike tours and really long backpacking trips out in the wilderness and uh -huh. crazy feats of human endurance. Yeah. And, and then combined with that, I was trying to live off of basically rabbit food because in my in my mind at that time and everything that I'd been bombarded with from the general public's and, and confirming evidence that, that your theory might be right, you know, it's probably not right. Mm -hmm. And it, it's because it's health, nutrition, physical function, the human body, it's not simple and it's not static. It's always in motion. It's always a moving target. Our needs, physical, our physiological needs are changing from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. Um, if you just put, let's say, a little bit of salt, if you eat one bite of something salty, mm -hmm. your body will start to crave water because your body needs to dilute that salt to keep a steady concentration of water to sodium in every cell of your body and in all your 18 liters or whatever of interstitial fluid, your blood. So the body's always doing that. So the, the big lesson to me is that our bodies come hardwired with information and voluntary or involuntary mechanisms throughout our bodies and all of our systems that are designed to keep us healthy, alive, well, functioning, not sick. Um, and those things work really well. They work for all organisms. We're the only species intelligent enough to actually be able to fill up a bottle of water and see how many ounces or milliliters are in that bottle and how much fluid we're consuming. Yet every creature on earth, wild, domestic, and, and otherwise, are able to keep themselves from dying of starvation, of dehydration. They're able to breathe in and out and get all the oxygen that they need and maintain the right proportions of carbon dioxide and oxygen. All these different levels in, in the blood and, and so on, in the body, all of our biochemicals, that system works involuntarily. And what we're doing with all these crazy ideas about health is that we're suppressing those internal mechanisms, those internal involuntary mechanisms that work, and we're suppressing those with ideology. And mm -hmm. we're often stifling, oh, we have a craving for this, but we stifle that craving because that's not healthy because of something we read on the internet. Uh, we're not thirsty, we're peeing frequently, hey, it doesn't matter. We know we're supposed to drink X number of ounces of, of water per day because that's what my doctor said or that's what I read on some health website. We're not doing things based on our internal involuntary mechanisms. We're suppressing all that intelligence and we're trying to micromanage this with ideas that are generated inside of our skulls. And it's a disaster. And I'm not saying that we can just eat and do whatever we want and be perfectly healthy, but it's the outcome of doing that and not even thinking about it is usually better than becoming obsessed with it. And it's certainly a lot easier and more fun and will keep you feeling healthier and happier just to try to follow those involuntary cues to eat when you're hungry, drink when you're thirsty, obey some of your cravings, exercise when you feel like exercising, quit exercising when you feel exhausted, not push yourself through it, have a rest day when you don't feel motivated. You know, if we if we obey all these different cues, we get, you know, a foolish person would do. Um, and, uh, and, and there I was, you know, preaching the gospel of high, high, uh, high fat, high protein, low carbohydrate eating. And, um, and I would say the first six months of that was the best six months I've ever had in my life. And then all of a sudden things started to progressively go downhill. And I was just absolutely enamored and infatuated with how great I had felt in the first six months mm -hmm. that I was stubborn about switching and doing something different. Not only 
had I invested my, you know, everything in, in basically preaching the gospel of this on the internet and writing books and building up a business about this, um, you know, but I was just so enamored with this amazing way that I had felt for six months. I kept just wanting to get back there and I kept restricting more and more. I got to the point where I was, um, eating no carbohydrates at all. That was a mess. And, uh, and then I started doing, um, you know, other things. I did a 30 day milk fast for a while. I mm-hmm. did lots of, uh, fasting at various periods uh, along the way where I would eat nothing, you know, have nothing but fruit juice for a week and other crazy things. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I was just seeking that elusive, good, healthy feeling. And, it it just kept slipping farther and farther away and eventually i had to just kind of say screw it and then i went through the the screw it phase which is all this you know health food stuff is a bunch of nonsense and i should just you know forget all this and go back to eating what i was eating as a teenager when i felt great and when i did that i felt amazing i felt a lot better all the health problems i had accumulated from being a healthaholic uh, went away mm-hmm. and uh, i i kind of went you know, and became a junk fooditarian for a while. And, you know, and then of course I ran into consequences from doing that. And, you know, now the the final phase is sort of getting back into balance and eating a healthy diet, but not in a fanatical, naive, you know, be- belief that, that I'm going to find this perfect diet and become a superhuman kind of way, but just basic self-care and also still being functional socially, being able to eat normal food with friends and family and not be a weirdo, but at the same time still make sure I'm eating nutritious food, exercising every day, moving my body around, keeping it functional and mobile, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's kind of the process that I went through. And I see so many people going through that process step by step. And, and that's <clears throat> kind of, I've become sort of the, the, the guy that you go to, I'm the safe haven for recovering healthaholics and dieters and, and people that suffer really harsh eating disorders and, and all that. Yeah. So could, would you say there are, if you could, you know, make some, some bullet points here, were there any major lessons that you learned that you think would be useful, useful for people to know? Well, the big one is that, you know, first of all, if you have an idea um, and you get really excited about it, you find some. So let's uh, let's talk about who you are, what you do, and your whole journey through dieting, exercise, and all of that. I'm just a man, Michael. <laughs> just a man. Um, no, I uh, I got really interested in health and nutrition. Uh, it's just kind of always been with me. I remember even as a kid, I was always picking my breakfast cereals based on what had the highest percentages of the RDA on on the spines. And even as like an eight or nine year old, it was ridiculous. So. Yeah. Um, so I was always been uh, nerdy about health and interested in it and, um, always wanting to be proactive. It wasn't until my my mid to late twenties that, um, you know, I really decided to jump both feet first into health and nutrition research. So I, I really jumped in and started, uh, just immerse myself in the field and began writing, blogging, communicating with other people about it. I set out to be, you know, what I quote called quote an independent health researcher and mm-hmm. that's how I got into it and you know overdoing it for nearly a decade now I accumulated just a massive amount of useful information and expertise I definitely stumbled across some things along the way that um, that have been very helpful to thousands of people all over the world and uh, that's kind of where I'm at today and I've written a, a, a billion books too many 
I've unpublished almost as many as I have currently for, <laughs> published on <Really? laughs> Amazon. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just, uh, I've been a healthaholic and, uh, I'm kind of a recovering healthaholic at this point, which I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll get into a little bit also, but, yeah. but that's, that's me in a nutshell, just a sort of a, a health and nutrition research obsessive, uh, gone author, gone, uh, recovering healthaholic. Mm-hmm. That's interesting that you've unpublished books. I feel like that's a rare thing, but it, it says a lot about, you know, who you are and what you do, the fact that you're willing to to change, you know, your ideas and not get attached to anything. That's one thing that's made me unique. I mean, everybody who's followed me knows and has known and recognized instantly from the beginning that I was really looking for answers. I was trying to do my very best to generally just genuinely find the truth. And I was willing to explore all different kinds of ideas and avenues to get there. And, you know, of course, early on, I had ideas, I thought they were correct, I found research that supported it. And then, you know, later on, I found stuff that contradicted it. And then I started thinking differently. And then I realized that my earlier ways of thinking were more primitive and flawed. Mm -hmm. And so I often changed directions and pivoted and pulled a 180, so to speak, which I've been, had many people all the time go, well, you should call it, you should change the name to 360 degree health because you're always, <laughs> you know, f- you flip the back the other way now. Yeah. So anyway, I've gotten a lot of grief, but yes, of course, uh, along the way, I'm willing to completely throw out in the, in the media's view about health is that we should eat mostly salad and <laughs> um, whole grains and vegetables and things like that. And no, and, no uh, saturated fat, right? No saturated fat. Yeah. Um, you know, stay away from tasty things and eat mostly this type of low calorie density type of roughage. Mm-hmm. So I try to eat uh, kind of a, an herbivore's diet while exercising my brains out. And all it really did was make me want to binge harder and harder on Krispy Kreme donuts and ice cream and things <laughs> that I thought were like the worst foods you could possibly eat at the time. And they're probably not ideal foods. Let's not kid ourselves. But at the same time, um, you know, considering what I was doing to myself, which was burning thousands of calories a day, exercising, you know, up to eight to 10 hours a day on average, not every once in a while, but on average. Uh, and then trying to eat as little as possible, the most important thing, the priority above all else at that time to keep me functioning, just functioning basically was to get calories. Mm -hmm. So the best foods, the healthiest foods for me at that time are the ones that contain the most calories. Those are the foods that kept me from dropping more and more muscle mass, getting colder and colder, becoming increasingly impotent. And of course, you know, once you get to a point where you're really in a big enough calorie deficit, no matter how old you were. And I was 21 at the time and I was having erectile issues, which is a perfectly well-suited topic for the the theme of this, yeah. this effective man uh, deal. So, so yeah, it was, it was a hard time and I was doing all this stuff in the name of health. Um, so anyway, flash forward to about age 27 and that's when I started to get really serious about eating, you know, the quest for the perfect diet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the then elusive quest. The elusive quest <laughs> for the perfect diet. And, and I realized, you know, oh, I've been wrong this whole time. And, you know, I should be doing, you know, high intensity exercise and I should be eating mostly meat and fat and not all these carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are making me crave all these foods. And, mm-hmm. you know, I probably have candida and all these different things. Yeah, I was yeah. absorbing all this. Uh, all this alternative nutrition and alternative health dogma out there. And I started to follow that kind of stuff. And the initial results were profound. I mean, eating a a very highly vegetarian roughage-based diet while doing a ton of endurance exercise is a libido crusher. It's a muscle mass obliterator. It's a massive cravings facilitator, emotional instability galore. I switched over to this new way of eating and not exercising my brains out. And lo and behold, I started to feel really emotionally stable. Mm -hmm. My mood was good. Muscle mass just grew out of me. I remember the clothes that I was wearing, all my T-shirts started to get really tight, especially in the (laughs) arms, chest, and shoulders. And the pants I had were starting to fall off, and my weight wasn't changing. So my body was undergoing this great metamorphosis. Yeah, and and I thought that I had unlocked 
the great secret of all things held. And of course, I began preaching the gospel of all that on the internet, like mm -hmm. any uh, young, naive 